Hello, this is the November 23rd Beehive call. We have Jan, Chris, Antrenig, and myself, Michael. We have some very focused topics that will relate to the three of us, so I'm just fine as a small group. Uh, some random news, uh, Jan in the pre-show. Uh, raised a good question. I wonder if there is unattended D-trace on FreeBSD. It was mentioned on Oxide and Friends. And it's uh, a mystery if Colin could have used that for his amazing boot tracing for performance. Any comments on that, Jan? Or shall we go investigate what the unattended D-trace looks like and if it's on FreeBSD? It was just a question on my mind at the time. Cool. Let's yeah. research it. Why not? It's for the future. Um, from a parallel discussion, Andrew, if you're out there, who's regularly attending, but he's busy with a turkey right now, he had some questions about LSI firmware. Be very careful changing version. Uh, Antrenik, did you work out your NFS issues by moving to V4? I have worked out my NFS issues by moving to V4. Now, the only time when I get to that error, which is server DNS server not responding, trying again, or server DNS server not responding, timed out. Sorry, not yep. DNS, NFS. Jesus. NFS, yeah. That's <laughs> okay. yep. Apologies. No worries. Um, uh, um, uh, now the only time that that happens is when there's like an actual network bottom. Up. So like okay. the network bandwidth is actually full, uh, right. compared to before where it would happen where, uh, as maybe, I don't know, a couple of gigs would move and it would just die. Now right. it could easily go to 10 gig very, very properly. Good, 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 good. Pulling 10 gig, eh? Yes. Okay. Um, did you try again MTU9000 on SRIOV? Yes. What did you find? Um, no issues if you set the MBUFs properly. Uh, there is a, a tunable or CCTL. I'm not sure it's which one, actually. If it's in, should be in kernel or not. It's called... Yeah, drop in chat. Yes. Yes. Uh, by default, the number says 4,000. Uh, by default, the number is 4,096. Uh, it's called, an, I, I, I'm not sure if it's exactly this one or not, but if, when I changed this, it looked fine. It's vm.uma.mbuffjumbopage.size. Uh, I, I pasted it in the chat. Oh, you did. Uh, I changed, yes. Anytime. I changed that to uh, 9,000, then I, no, 9,000 something plus, plus 36, I guess. Jan, you might remember. You might know, rather. Um, and then I set my MTU to 9,000, and after that, my weird Intel card hasn't been complaining about admin queues. A backstory here is that some Intel cards, specifically the uh, 710, yep. uh, 10 gig, um, would start complaining that admin queue cannot be allocated. Um, you try to Google this, there is no answer nowhere. Uh, this only happens if, if it's set, if, if, if the MTU is bigger than the jumbo page size. So you can uh, increase the jumbo page size. I did it in loader.com, but it might be a, a sys. I'm, I'm not sure. I have to check with that one actually. I'm so sorry. No, no, um, no, yeah. no worries. And when you have a chance, yeah. tell me those values before and after, if, if they're yes. Handy. The the def yeah the default is four thousand ninety six. Yep. I set it to nine thousand ninety six just because I I don't think if it's like it worked, but it it might have also worked with nine thousand. I just changed the four to nine there actually, and then setting the MTU to nine thousand, I didn't get the complaint with um the Intel seven hundred ten model anymore, the seven ten anymore. Um, cool. And I did, I did, I did do. Um, oh, uh, that one is read only. Uh, I'm guessing then it's the other one because anything I saw there, I changed. Um, let's see. Unless it's at only at boot time, uh, maybe. Or could be only at boot time. Yes. If it knows that it is, um, if the uh, SUSCTL is marked uh, as a tunable, SUSCTL would tell you. That it's a loader tunable. Cool. And it makes sense that you can't change the page size at runtime. 
Yeah, of course. Uh, basically, of course. yeah. <laughs> Can't so you think, think of a much more adjusted? invasive change <laughs> to a virtual memory account. subsystem. <laughs> um, so let me go over my shell history and find the exact one. But yeah, the, the idea cool. was that you would change the page size to a higher number than the default. Um, what else did I run into in there? Yeah, just throw uh, I in was whatever facts to... you have that I might have wrong in the notes. Yes, Thank uh, you. I can generate I can generate uh, sixty uh, four visual functions, so you would have overall sixty five interfaces. Uh, I tried all of them with with both pass pass through and without pass through, and it all worked fine. Um, and it, it did also do proper pass throughs. By the way, I um, apparently VMB Hive has a nice. Uh, interface called vm pass through that hmm. would print you the uh, the pci numbers and if it's able to pass through or not so you would get oh, good information. Oh, that's good to know uh let's I'll make a note of that. yes and uh, i also did it without pass through so i passed them to the jails it also worked fine no issues there i think that's a phenomenal technology for anyone who doesn't want to rely on the bridge interface okay repeat that you can use the sriov for jails Yes. Nice. Yes. Uh, yeah. And we we might even have that recorded in one of the previous calls because yeah. me and Jan tested it once on the call, but I I might forget which one. It was months ago when I just got yeah. the system. By the way. Nice. Um. um I test. Yeah. Cool. I tested that too with jails. Works fine. No issues. Using just ePair, or you pass in a device or something exotic. You, um, you you pass you pass the IAVF device, the visual function device itself, to the VNet. So you would do if config uh, IAVF, let's say thirty two VNet, the jail name, and it would pass the physical visual function. Nice physical visual function. What you get no. the point. <laughs> it would pass the visual function device to the uh, to to the jail. Uh, works without any issue. Yeah, drop in a syntax because that's pretty darn cool because high-speed networking is always a concern. Anyway, cool. Great work. Anything else that's not process supervision? Um, what else um, what you can oh, do yes. is the clean solution is to not hack it in shell at, at runtime or for the hook, but to uh, unless you have a very specific sequencing problem where you're missing a hook, the right place is to put in the uh, vnet.interface uh, or interfaces, I don't know uh, for sure. Um, one of those two names is correct. Uh, jail.conf parameter. And then uh, the jail command will, uh, after the jail has been created, but before the start command inside the jail is executed, uh, move the devices over. And it doesn't matter if you're moving an ePair uh, interface or another kind of interface, uh, which means that if you have multiple of the virtual functions configured as a non-pass-through so that they show up on the host network stack and aren't hidden from the host network stack to be passed through as PCI pass-through devices, then you can uh, use them uh, either as normal interfaces on the host or move them over to uh, VNet enabled jails. And then you have uh, basically ha a hardware switch in your NIC uh, at no CPU overhead. Um, the only downside is that you may run out of resources because it's quite likely that such a big system with like, for example, two terabytes of RAM will run more than 64 jails uh, concurrently then, yeah. You have to uh, decide which jail gets this. And the other problem is that uh, you can't uh, update the virtual function uh, configurations at runtime. So for example, you can't change the MAC address of the virtual function without recreating all of them, which is a bit invasive, but with jails, at least you could steal them for a second, reconfigure everything and move them back and reassign their IP addresses and hope that everything continues but with uh, beehive you can't do that because uh, you can't reset the mm, interfaces without killing all the beehive guests 
but jails at least the processes could survive even if you were disconnecting them from the network for however long the um, reconfiguration takes i found a possible bug in uh, probably sysstat so the output that you're saying seeing in front of you is sysstat dash if stat which prints yeah, the uh, interface information uh, as you can see i picked i picked around a couple of hundred thousand terabytes per second <laughs> apparently that's an integer yeah. overflow bug okay yes. yeah good point yes um, it, it is an integer overflow traffic bug. counter um, overflow i i have not looked into uh, the the source code of sys that yet but i will look into it and beneath that, it you can see yes go on is that the right syntax is that dash i have said yes is that okay. dash if stat yes and so beneath the, it you can uh -huh. the 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 terabyte numbers are not possible uh, no no, no. The, the the peak is not oh, possible. the peak is not possible okay <laughs> of course look at that uh, if we had that kind of yeah. memory bandwidth we would be very happy yes oh, on terabyte forget the yeah, memory okay. bandwidth that's that's <laughs> just physically not possible like yeah. that's faster than to the marketing the department chris you're with the foundation just <laughs> boom put that in the next <laughs> journal you got it we're set we have the fastest system ever built <laughs> Yeah, it's it's faster than the speed of light. So you know, we we we, we, we free BSD quantum computers ready. <laughs> or whatever's after. Ex right? Exabytes a second. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um. Yeah. But yeah, I will look into the code for that. And beneath cool. that is the uh, IOVCTL configuration for uh, how to make it up and running. So the device is the device name IXL one number of virtual functions two, then virtual function zero and virtual function one. One of them is path through false, so I can give it to the host. The other one is path through two, true, so I can give it to the guest, in this case, beehive. And the last bit, um, I think I sent into the chat from my documentation. Yeah, so it's IOVCTL enable equals okay. yes. In, okay, got it. Uh, in the, uh, what do you call that? In RC con. And then you have to specify the files. So it would be IOVCTL, basically whatever your path is. Feel free to put whatever your path is. Um, that part is not documented as far as I know. Um, maybe it is in RCCon, but I'm not in front of a proper computer. I mean, it's a mobile phone. So, uh, yeah. yeah. The IOVCTL enable and files. I, I don't know about files, but the enable, I think, is documented in my RCConf. Let me check. Oh, it's in RCCon. It, it is in RCCon. Yes. Yeah. The files variable is documented in the rc.conf man page. Yes. It's a space yes. separated list of configuration files used by IOVCTL. If I remember correctly, that is a bit conservative because it's uh, input field separator separated list, but yes. So in theory, you could also use tabs and U lines if you like pain and suffering. So there's that. Um, what else do oh. I have from the last week? Entrenig. Um, yes, sir. A little birdie told me you had a capture the flag event and you did some IF config shenanigans, if you're familiar with that term. Uh, yes, we've been running our Armenia's capture the flag, only capture the flag from the, 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 the competition. This is a hacking competition for those who are not aware. Uh, on FreeBSD for half a decade now. Uh, the first ones were unfortunately on Ubuntu because Azure didn't even support FreeBSD at the time. Uh, but yeah, we've been doing it on, uh, on, on uh, what do you call that? On, uh, great, my audio is dead, I think. One, two, I hear you. and it's back. We okay, hear you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so we've been running it on FreeBSD. Uh, this year, uh, just like last year, we used Jailer for automating the jails. Worked fine. This year, we also added Super V into the uh, mix um, because, you know, dog food. eat your own food, I guess. Yeah, dog food. It's, it's exactly. Um, a couple of uh, FreeBSD shenanigans that we've tried in there. One of them is, um, one of them is uh, the if config bug slash feature where you can set the interface name to um, anything within 15 characters. And Jan, that's the only requirement, right? It has to be unique and it has to be 15 characters. 
uh, not empty uh, and up to 16 if you include the zero bytes. Yeah. So uh, we had uh, um, a situation where we had a jail with uh, a couple of hundred, specifically in this case, it was seven, 740 interfaces. Yes, a jail with 740 inter interfaces, network interfaces, and all of the network interfaces were emojis. I mean, the name of the network interfaces were emojis. So, no, emoji, uh, or rather, if config, um, uh, black ice cream emoji, uh, you know, inet, uh, or something like that. So, it, 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 it works. It, it absolutely works without any issue, to, to, to be clear. How many interfaces um, was that? 740. Oh, there, yeah, I chose that because there was like uh, 740 emojis following each other without any gap. So I just generated them <laughs> instead of copy-pasting. Love it, love it, love it. Other love otherwise, it. I would have had the gaps in there. So yeah, 740 interfaces in a, in a single jail. Uh, no issues, by the way. Like, I was expecting if config to go slow, but with a couple of hundred, not a couple of hundred, a hundred and something players logged in, all running if config, trying to figure out where, where the flag is, worked fine without any issues. And what do you see on the command line? Does a shell give you an emoji or just a big old, like, UTF character? No, it's, a, it's, it's an emoji. It's pure emoji. Actually, let me send you a well, screenshot. No. Yeah. Can I Depends on image? your uh, terminal emulator. If your terminal yeah. uh, emulator is UTF-8 compatible and you have a Unicode uh, font with lots of emojis, yeah. you will see emojis. If okay, not, okay. you will see the uh, glyph not present. If you have no UTF-8 support, you will see random garbage. Okay. <laughs> um so yeah and the and the flag was actually hidden uh i would say inside a um uh inside uh, uh inside the description field of an interface but because the description field also has no limitations we used uh hex value 080 aka backspace so you know the flag would be written then backspace would delete the flag and then print the rest of the description. They had to figure out how the hell does a computer print, you know, values so they can basically go into it. Yeah. So it, that was the whole idea. Uh, apparently, people loved it. I, I don't know why they would love that, but people loved it. Where the hell is that screenshot? I will. Okay. While you look for that, Jan, what's the name of that character, the 80 something? Passion, passion, what's. That's the ASCII backspace. Yeah, what's the name exactly? Backspace. Well, eighty. He had the like hex value or something. Yeah, I put it in chat. Uh, yeah, thank hex oh, uh, thank eight zero. Yep. I see it. Uh, one hundred twenty seven. Uh, sorry. Uh, it it's not. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Um... Oh, my computer is so slow. Yeah. Um. Bad stuff. Um, men have an ASCII if you want an ASCII table on a FreeBSD system. Thank you. There's an off by one error in the in my chat message. Oh, it, oh, you pick. So, what should it be? Twenty eight or what? Which one's off? Do I have it correct in the minutes or not? It's 127, so it's not back, it's not a uh, hex uh, 80, but it's hex uh, 7 uh, F. Thank you for the delete. Okay, and that's or you can use uh, depending on what you want to do and how you want to do it. You can also use uh, hex 08 for backspace, or uh, Dell is. Uh, 7f so all the lower seven bits are one which has historical reasons so that you can punch it out uh dep independent of what was the previous value on a punch card so that you can always override something as deleted by just punching all the holes that's really the justification they give for why delete is the all ones value Oh wait, BS backspace. Okay. Yeah, BS is uh 
zero eight and del lead or del is seven f. But that's details. Hey, we well, gotta talk punch cards on the call. It's important. Yeah, right. Antonego, are you struggling with audio or do you have something also cool coming up? And did do we have a winner on finding the flag in in interface descriptions? Um so um yes, many people have found it uh after the hint, of course, which was how does a computer print on the screen? By the way, I think the hex is zero. I think it's zero, um, supposed to be 80, not zero eight. Or am I wrong? No, it's the you're wrong. And the backspace. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm oh. not as, yeah. Backspace okay. is uh, in the low control uh, vectors and does not delete the content. So it just moves badly the cursor back and yeah. delete is supposed to override it. But yeah, some systems handle them basically equivalent. So it's yeah. good. Quite likely, depending on your terminal emulator, that both work for your purposes. Oh, you were digging up we a screenshot. Also, right, cool. We also had an OpenBSD challenge using pledge and uh, unavail. Unveil, unavail, unveil. Unveil, I think. Unveil. Yes, unveil. It's a very, both of them are cool. I love pledge. Unveil was new to me um, when I was creating the uh, the hack. Um, and I mean, I've, I've worked with Pledge a lot, so that was not new for me. Um, however, um, I, no one was able to hack it. Uh, the bug was, have I looked at FreeBSD Capsicum? Yes, I have looked at it. I absolutely hate it. It's, it's awful. It's pure awful. After Pledge, Capsicum feels like the worst idea ever. Um, so yeah, um, we just need Pledge on FreeBSD. We just need, we just need Pledge in FreeBSD actually. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we had we had also an open BSD one with the pledge and unveil. No one was able to get in. They had the source code of the TCP server running, but they probably didn't have enough time to understand how pledge and unveil work to be able to hack it. Um, yeah, it was it was a it was a bug in the code. There was no exploit on the kernel. It just was a pure bug. Um, Jan, correct me um, if I'm wrong. I mean, technically, both unveil and pledge can be done via capsicum. Right? No. Okay. Pledge? They, they are completely different by design. Um, no. Pledge I'm is basically a way to... Saying... Hold on. Let, let Antonik finish. He's clarifying. Uh, by, by de... I'm not saying by design, but rather by practice. No, you can't. Okay. Now go Pledge on. Pledge still um, allows you restrictive access to the global namespaces. So for example, with Pledge, you can still go yes. through the file system, but you may not be able to fork or exec yeah. or open a new network socket or stuff like this. Do the NS query. Signal if you have the ability to send signals. It's just that you basically partition the functionalities uh, available through system calls into, um, into um, named partially overlapping sets like so um you have functionality under a label and you can say and as soon mm -hmm. as you have one restriction you, you want to keep you basically lose all others so or you say i want to pledge that i will the most extreme example let's say i pledge i'm using only standard io so on, from now on you can only read and write on the lowest three file descriptors or close them maybe seek on them but yeah, that's about it. Um, and the other thing is with uh, Pledge, when you are still allowed to fork an exec, the new uh, exec process is no longer pledged. That's by design because Pledge isn't designed to be a real capability mode or an unescapable mm -hmm. sandbox, but a way for the developer to tell the kernel what the developer intends the current process to do going forward. And then the kernel yes. will uh, verify this at runtime and uh, kill the process if it uh, violates the pledges it made to the kernel. 
I'm, I'm very familiar with pledge. My problem is trying to understand capsicum because capsicum yep. is very weird. And no, uh, as far as... I have okay. to disagree there that Let capsicum finish, is weird. Yeah. Uh, it's capsicum is definitely. theoretically pure and clean and elegant, but annoying in the real world. Um, <laughs> so uh, capsicum is a real capability ABI. So at the moment you enter capability mode, you lose access to the global namespaces and only can derive new... Uh, equal or weaker capabilities from the ones you brought into a uh, capability mode. So capabilities are represented by file descriptors. And for example, reading and writing from standard IO works the same within Capsicum. But you, for example, you can still open a file relative to a directory if you have a file descriptor for the directory with open ed, but you can't. Uh, go into slash temp and look what someone else placed there, uh, world readable by accident, or just because you're the currently logged in user, you can't go into the .ssh uh, folder and uh, place some shenanigans and append to the author's key file just because you have the same user ID. That, unless you have a file descriptor where, where you can go to this and you can no longer go out of a directory with dot dot uh, underneath the starting point of your file descriptor. So yeah, it's a really um, sane, clean, theoretically sound design. The problem is that that makes it very hard to retrofit to existing code because basically everywhere where your crawl out or one of the libraries you are using uh, accesses a shared namespace you have a problem because you now have to redesign. Starting from scratch, uh, it's almost as easy to write code with Capsicum than without, because it's very expressive and flexible, but retrofitting it to any code with non-trivial interactions with the system is really hard and painful, which is why we have only a fraction of the tools in our theoretically sounds safe same sandbox that uh, OpenBSD has in their good enough uh, solution. Yeah. yeah that, that's, that's kind of the messy part is that in, in OpenBSD, while Pledge does very tiny bit, which is like restricting access to system calls, um, it does it very well. Like I've used it for a customer before. It's just a literally single line that I add. And now there you go my access to a specific system calls are restricted. Or with Unveil, it's again, just a single call and my access to a specific path of, on, uh, a, or rather I only have access to the path that I need nothing else. With, uh, with Capsicum, it's very elegant in the sense that you can do a lot of things with it, but not the, you know, not the, uh, not the syscall restriction, of course. Uh, you can do a lot of things with it, but using it in real life is becoming painful. Like I, I had a look at uh, one of the simplest software that we have on FreeBSD, which is write, as in like a write to another user's terminal. That 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 software. That's not was, simple was, in regards yeah, to that, capabilities. That's the very definition of accessing a global namespace. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> I don't know but what 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 simple. Is, with someone's login shell in them. Okay, so you loop over all the TTYs. You then access uh -huh. your elevated privileges to basically violate their TTY and then inject some thing. That's basically the worst case uh, of, because you, yeah. Okay. You would have to basically, okay. what? what you could do I think... is- Go ahead, uh, you Chris, just as a, okay. Then and then, <laughs> Enter capability <laughs> once you have the file descriptors. Well, my experience with Capsicum has been actually pretty neat, particularly just like Jan mentioned, when you create something new, it's it's really uh, quite easy to get started with that. The only uh -huh. trouble that I had in my experience was when you when we were dealing with, let's say, multiple files, because you mentioned write, for example, 
then it can become quite tedious unless you already know all the files that you want to touch when you go into capability mode. Because yeah. either you already have the handles, because if you don't have the handles by the time, I mean, you need, you need to be prepared for the space that you want to access. Just like Jan basically mentioned, if, it's, if you're in the design phase, then you can incorporate that. But if you, if you already have the code, then you might have the to redesign the whole thing. Is to uh, keep a unique socket to the process and have split the logic up into the uh, un uh, sandbox code, which does yeah, only a fraction that's how I did of it. the exactly. logic, and then basically yep. you send in file descriptors and yep. into I, the I, process. Um, I actually, that... I actually did it with with four processes that pipe stuff basically back into the to the yeah. capability. Of container yeah exactly uh, and the nice thing with capsicum is that you can really can basically use formal methods to analyze it and basically you can trust that these other than variants it's really a capability abi you can just go through it and trust it that if i'm in this mode these are my capabilities this is the worst case i can do without exploiting the um, unknown bug in the kernel Hmm. Whereas with pledge, um, it's less formalized. It's more ad hoc. Like, what does this label mean? Well, it means whatever the developers implementing it did, and what what did they do? What they thought was uh, reasonable. What did they really do? Nobody knows. <laughs> there is no formal model for it. Do you have any comments specifically relating to Beehive and Capsicum, or shall we move on? Yeah, for example, Beehive and Capsicum um, is a good example where it works because Beehive gets its configuration, it passes its configuration that tells it which uh, file descriptors it needs, so which capabilities. Once it has them opened, it enters capability mode. And even if you have an attack against Beehive and you uh, escape from the guest into the Beehive uh, demon, uh, you're limited to what you can do with these file descriptors and the remaining APIs available through the capability mode. So for example, just because Beehive is running as root does not mean that you can uh, just load a kernel module uh, and load a rootkit if you uh, have a guest escape into the Beehive process. Like for example, with the VGA emulation buffer overflow, where the color palettes in DC had uh, 32 instead of 8 bit, and so you could overflow them. And yeah, that only got you into the Beehive process. If I remember cool. correct. It now did we move not on. get you anywhere else. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, Chris, because we might dive into demos, go ahead and you know, give give an, a, a promo for the upcoming call, the Enterprise Working Group. So call. I think Greg mentioned a bunch of the stuff already last week, I think. And um, I just wanted to mention that basically next, no, next not this week, Friday, but next week, Friday, uh, December 1st, 1030 Eastern, there's going to be the next uh, Enterprise Working Group call. And Greg and me and Joe will give updates on those particular topics, Beehive, Jails Management, OCI Runtime, Open GDK, and uh, GPU and AI support. And I think Greg mentioned a lot of the stuff, particularly also in regards to OCI already last week, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, so there's definitely progress on that. I think Greg also shared uh, some, was it some pull requests, I think? Let me check really quick if I can find that. Oh, that's the one, yes, which was with the either pot or related folks. I think it's in the other notes or down below. It's for it's for the OCI run. Oh, we definitely had a good job conversation OCI on jail. that. Yeah, I'm gonna put that in the jail as well. Perfect. Uh, in the in the chat. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> Danke. Ooh, I'll I'll discreetly slip in some news. 
uh, Jan Michaels, he goes by a few names, XC is quite exciting, but it sounds like he's working for a fruit company and might not be able to work on it. And so that uh, might need some updating. Just saying. Yeah, um, XE, um, I filed a bug report and haven't gotten a report uh, response yet. Uh, yeah, you might get it from Tim Apple. Um, it's, it's a fairly simple fix. Uh, the problem is that the uh, way he uh, invokes the BSD tar command mm -hmm. uh, using dash T, uppercase T, um, is a problem because he basically pipes in a bunch of paths to add to a tar archive, and then tar will recursively add all of these paths. So it means that every busy, if you have a okay. subdirectory, it link. gets at student. Post the link. Price. Yeah. Post the link. No problem. <laughs> yeah, it's a little off topic. And, uh, uh, the... Greg has, uh, uh, Chris has the floor regarding Greg's pull request mentioned. And yeah, it's uh, here. And uh, he just has, if this flag is set, he has to change for tar invocation to disable uh, recursion. So pass dash n to the uh, tar command, and then it should work as it's required to, instead of, I was okay. wondering why my tarballs were, despite compression, larger than the inputs. <laughs> so he had a neat tar-related command. I forget the name, but it was clever. Was it ITAR? It sounds right. Should, yeah, is that something that should be standalone, it. regardless of yeah, his it remarkable is standalone. Tool? It's really just a, a wrapper around tar to, uh, to uh, do the... Um, application of whiteouts basically in addition right. to unpacking the tar or a recording of whiteouts and you can either specify the whiteouts on the command line or it can use ZFS diff to auto discover the okay. whiteouts in the form of oh. deletions between two ZFS snapshots. What was the name of that tool? I don't want to forget it. Uh, you just take a look at the link. Uh, it's part of a repository. Oh, thank you. Oh, you I saw the two GitHub links and I confused them. Yay. Uh, he's definitely on social media, and that's, I believe, how I found out about yep. this. So, uh, no, it's a neat little tool, but it's mostly a wrapper around tar. So, yeah. So, Jan, you have a bug report on Jan's tool. Yeah, but <sighs> it's for anyone familiar with the Rust code. It's a trivial fix, uh, which is why I didn't include any code because basically his whatever he wants to change with the idea and how he wants to implement is larger than whatever code I could send in because oh. it's really just a There's change the else. vector of uh, command line arguments by one byte if a certain flag is true or false. Can I jump in here with a question? You've got because, the floor. Um, since, yes. you started, since you started to talk about TAR I um, I was walking through the mailing list conversation about improving the snapshot file format for Beehive. And there's been conversations going around for different, you know, binary yeah. formats with different kinds of byte level headers. And then the conversation moved, why not use NVList? And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying what was said. Let him finish. Let him finish. <laughs> Uh, I'm 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 just thinking right now. I think Beehive is spitting out. I think like two files, um, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly. Um, obviously, if we want to transport and migrate a snapshot to a different host, it would make sense to also add some metadata about the host where the the guest originated from, so we can check whether the CPU uh, is compatible and whether the memory fits and everything. I'm just wondering if. It would be a worthwhile alternative to NVList, for example, to use something like tar, because at the end of the day, the yeah. easiest way, I suppose, would be to just tar everything into a tar bowl and then move mm. that over. Depending on how you want to look at it. Um, to make it easy, especially for local persistence, it would be nice to just keep on using the file system for it. And if you do it yes. the right way, it would be quite easy to basically either write 
to a directory or use libarchive to write to a tar. Exactly. So that, yes, see, the, I was thinking about lib libarchive. Goes through, uh, similar to how the uh, SQLite uh, VFS works, it's just the struct of function pointers. And you have one implementation for a directory and one against libarchive, uh, uh, which is already part of a base system. Uh, so exactly. It, that is one thing you could do. Something else, which may be uh, tempting, is to write it as an ALF file so that it's basically a position independent uh, shared library, which uh, would make it possible to quickly find uh, structured data in a very large file. One of the downsides with TAR is that it's a stream. So uh, the, if you want to find the small metadata fast, you have to put it at the beginning of the archive. Yeah, that's true. Be uh, which, if you know about this limitation for this application, isn't a problem unless you have to write the small little data after the large data, then you have a problem. Unless you're prepared to go back and update in place. But that's no longer compatible with streaming. And yeah, that's the ridiculous uh, interface list. Okay. Looks at your font doesn't have all. Yeah, that's a nice one. Yeah. So okay. So not to change the subject there, but yes, thank you, Antoneg, for so, that yeah, and beautiful work of art. So basically, we have an, a lib elf in base as well. So it may be a good idea to really turn this into a an elf archive if it has the properties which make that reasonable. One of the nice things is that you could reallocate the big, big things basically in the metadata at the beginning and then write them out as a Is there any size limitations on elf or, uh, or not? Yeah, 64 bits. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, <laughs> that should be enough, I guess. <laughs> yes, it is. So, um, I mean, you can, you don't, yeah, but um, so a 32 bit elf has a size limitation of, I think, two or four gigabytes. I don't know which one, but yeah, I don't know if they're signed integers in there, but at least, but there's no reason why you can't use a 64 bit uh, elf as a file format, even if you can't execute it, even on the 32 bit systems, because libelf can read uh, other architectures. Um, but the, the downside is that it's, uh, um, yeah, it's a big uh, binary file. One of the neat things with tar is that now that we have tar as in FreeBSD 14, you could just mount the tar ball and get the directory layout back. Ooh, that landed. The, uh, uh, the TFS yeah. is part of 14 years. Ooh, ooh, let me make a note of that. Uh, one uh, thing to watch out for is that TFS is really a TAR file. So whatever vNode caching it does to not have to rescan the file, either it has for really big uh, archives or those with lots of little files, TAR is really a terrible format for um, random accesses. It's a stream archive. It's after all a tape archive yeah. format and not <laughs> it's well, the name. In principle it's with the snapshot, the, with the snapshot, I would assume that would be fine because you read that in and then yeah, exactly. I mean, For, you no longer. Uh, uh, what I uh, was worried about is that you basically have to dump the main memory contents or potentially even the disks and then write some new file with small metadata at the end. Like the last some kind of checksum or whatever, and they would have to go last. And then you have a problem unless you're prepared to go back. But if you go back, you lose one of, you lose the streaming property. LibArchive can basically allow you to go back in the file and change it because it does not check some of the content of a tar normally, but uh, you then have to write it the tar to a tar and can, for example, no longer pipe it directly into SSH you do that if you ever revisit a file and seek back. So it may right. end up with some of the data after the big blobs. 
if we can spend yeah the thing is you read you read the you read the checksum at the time when you already have read everything and then <laughs> you're yeah, either screwed already right. or yeah but um, if uh, the yeah, format is uh, defined in such a way that basically you write all the little things uh, like the cpu level the things which don't change while you're taking the snapshot then you dump the snapshot and you split that up that then you have basically at least two metadata files one before the part where it tells you if you can import it on your machine because this is the cpu flex and stuff uh, like cpu ida values and something and then you have the memory content and potentially maybe even the virtual disk content which could run easily into the tens or hundreds of gigabytes and then you have the small little chunk at the end with cpu state or whatever happens there like register file content or something and if you split it up in such a way you could uh, stream it which is also probably uh, something really tempting which yeah an elf file i think wouldn't allow so tar is a good idea for this i think and i know that vitel is kind of frustrated with this being a blocker of his work it's like well guys you know everyone just please decide on something let me know <laughs> And he wants Let, to have so, a separate call with, say, John and company, John Baldwin. So, yeah, uh, I'm Chris, in no position feel free to, to kind um, of nudge along there because we're not progressing. Yeah. So I'm in no yes, position I, to I, tell him what he can do and can't do, but I would prefer it if he just uh, did it, write it to a file system, uh, and then someone else can come back and implement the tar abstraction and basically write the same into a tar uh, unless the file format he's currently materializing in the directory is so terrible that he really doesn't want uh, to ever see the light of day. <laughs> yeah. So, so for example, for little blobs here and there, like the contents of the CPU register file, something like NVList is fast enough, good enough, whatever, may not be perfect, but uh, it will work. You don't want to write out the main memory content of the virtual machine as a NV list, but you don't have to if you right. put it in its own file. Chris, does that help? right? It it definitely helps. The thing is, um, one of the things that was mentioned on the mailing list was that people uh, raised the point that it would very much make sense to have some tooling to be able to analyze uh, this this new snapshot file format so if we if we had an elf file or if we had something just like a binary setup of different kind of byte constructs we would have to create a whole new tooling set if we cr created an atar file by just you know combining the existing files with additional metadata into a tar file then at least some degree of tooling is already there um, which yes I think no. would at um, least help. If I, if I remember correctly, the file format right now is basically use libxo to write the hex strings containing the register values as a JSON blob with, yes, it's text, but it's not human readable. It's not readable. I agree, yes. It's, and you need to the memory, to I think, is just a bare it. dump, right? Yeah, If it I is. remember correctly. Uh, it yeah. is just a file with no metadata within it, which is what you want. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you want the directory of the tar to be the uh, whole thing. You don't want to have uh, something like an MPEG four container with metadata and data interleaved in multiple nested streams. That's... We might be interested in compressing the data, however. Yes, of course, but network. that's what you can do with a tar. Just that's what I'm thinking, yeah. Mix. Pipe it through whatever trade-off of compression versus efficiency you want, because and the nice thing with tar is that because there is no not too much structure, you can just pipe the whole thing through a compressor and you get compression across files, which if we have a lot of them can be very helpful. You can just pipe it through uh, Z standards or other compressors. 
Yep. So what is actionable at this point? Um, well, that, from my would... end, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to really write it up in a summary statement right. and bring all those opinions together and then hope to readdress all the guys um, on Fabricator and Michael, I have invite, to disagree with them you to minutes. conversation. Yeah. You have to what? You don't want to compress the metadata. Oh, that's what I mean, the latter. So I mean the, oh, I switched the two. Yeah, don't, don't, yeah. don't mix uh, data and metadata in a single file. Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, I know. That's why I, I, I had them reversed. Sorry. Yep. Fixed. Uh, so, so Chris, metadata that was on the enterprise working group list or virtualization or elsewhere? Yes, I'm. I'm. I want to keep that in the in the work stream for Beehive and Jails management on the enterprise working group. But that's exactly. where the yeah. the existing discussion was. That you brought. Uh, the discussion up. was happening on the mailing list. Which one? That was happening on the mailing list and on which, fabricated. Which mailing list? <laughs> uh yeah. I'm hold Maybe on a second. Has I'm gonna dozens. post Do you mean the enterprise link? working group? List? Yes, yes, of course. You're right. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes, of course. <laughs> um, here is the link to the mailing list, oh, cool. and yep, let cool. me find the oh virtualization. No, okay, cool. Let me uh... and this one at the most recent here on Fabricator, because it was also Vitaly that was writing on the mailing list plus doing this work on Fabricator as well. Yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, because he's kind of frustrated. <laughs> like, okay, I want to implement yes. this. And I, I understand. I, I completely tell understand me. this point. <laughs> tell me what I gotta the thing, do. The thing is the thing is it still totally makes sense to yeah. first redo or improve the file format because if we don't fix that first, you're gonna have to touch it twice. Yeah. Yep. And spin wheels and yay. Uh yeah. Okay. Uh Jan, did that sorry to interrupt, but did that address your concern there? Yes, my real concern isn't the details of how pretty does the data format look, but just is it acceptable uh, at all? Uh, and that is the case as far as I can tell. And the other problem is just it taking forever and trying to get it perfect, which I know a thing or two about. Uh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, does Linux have a TorFS? Any idea there? As far as I know, they don't have it for tar, unless is, you count something like, uh, going through Fuse. It's not in okay. the kernel. But if you want better performance than uh, tarfs, you can just use uh, makefs to basically use ufs as a, a file archive with perfect mm. fidelity of a ufs file system. It will create a densely packed read-only UFS file system, and then you can create a memory disk and mount it read only. It works on okay, 13. I... It performs a lot better. Oh, wait. TorFS is modifiable? Sense. What? TorFS is modifiable? Sorry, go ahead. No, no it isn't. Okay. Okay. Because when you said read only, I thought that TorFS wasn't read only. Okay. No, no. TorFS is read only, but uh, memory disks aren't. Necessarily, right. so you can uh, use uh, makefs to create a file system with some uh, reserve uh, capacity, and then you can mount it read write and use it like that. Hmm. There appears to be a kernel module for torfs for Linux, and I find it quite a funny side note because uh, the user is called Papier Corp, which in German yeah. is basically a uh, trash bin. So I'm um, not sure how much that says <laughs> okay. about the code quality. <laughs> yeah. So take it with a grain of salt, I guess. Yeah, but the relevant part is that the last commit was in 2017. And given how stable the Linux internal uh, API is, that means... It was six it's... years ago, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> it's done already, you know. There's Are nothing to improve. For kernel, or is it... No, the project was uh, abandoned, and that's it. And the name that's is... probably that. the reason, yeah. I do have to say on that aspect, the... Uh... A free BSD device drivers book. It is from two thousand, I think, eight or nine. Still very usable, I want to say. 
like 95% is very usable. I was going over it. I have a physical copy. I was going over it lately and it's very much usable. And of course there are a lot of changes, like new things, but the old things are still, pro yeah, still, still the, the only, the only, would be very useful. Yeah, of course. The only book that I have that's outdated on FreeBSD is a Russian FreeBSD handbook from 99, I guess. <laughs> With yeah, FreeBSD with the, device mm, drivers, uh, no starch book is from uh, 2012. So, yeah. This oh, is Kong, cool. eh? Yep. Maybe someone should uh, nudge him to find someone to work book. on a, with him together on a second revision. Yeah, that would take lots of encouragement from, say, the foundation because, hey, uh, that was one of their quiet, most quiet books, and he was a little frustrated with how unpopular it was because that was, you know, FreeBSD wasn't maybe that hot at the time, and uh, um, it's a bit of an obscure topic. But yeah, it's totally valid for those. Of course, it's celebrate. not a book uh, you will get rich with, and it could get into licensing problems if uh, No Starch uh, has the rights to future editions and then they but they don't see it as a viable product so they don't want to work but on they it, are but... lovely people fortunately so yeah maybe reach out to them um yeah i'm that's... just waiting for another for the next linux system d so we can gain more users that's that's the best way to gain more well, users. well <laughs> maybe broadcom will help us there Oh, of course. Oh, that's great. I think when the, when the yeah. system when 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 the kernel moves into system D, we're all gonna be uh, having a lot of new <laughs> users. <laughs> I'll be back in. It would be the other way around, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. So so the next meeting is in December first. The oh. next meeting is gonna be on December first. Yes, ten thirty right. Eastern. Mm -hmm. If I remember. Oh, there you go. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's a big one over 300 pages and yeah maybe the and Antrenig your comment was 90 percent is still valid 95 i would even say wow. i was going over it lately to go over some things that i forgot and i'm like oh wait this this still works that that part of code still works this idea is still the same why um, would we need a new edition haha -ha. uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of things for example like uh uh, if lib and so on aren't covered. This, this yes. Um, the IO MMUs aren't covered. They're barely working. <clears throat> Whoa, did I say it out loud? Yeah. No, I think you can you can apply that to almost anything. I'm I'm watching uh, Marshall Kirk McCusick's introduction to the FreeBSD open source operating system, the the video series. Yep. And I mean, <laughs> like a lot of that stuff is is still the same, really. And I think uh, one of the things which would also be relevant if you do it now would be, uh, at least if you're writing drivers for uh, high-end hardware, would be NUMA awareness in memory allocation and interrupt routing. So there are a bunch of things which... Um, cool. There's there's another one. Do you guys know designing BSD rootkits? Yes, uh, I love oh, that. Joseph, 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 Joseph Kong, that is also really nice. 2007, but oh, still totally applicable. That. Yeah. Yeah, that is great. Also, was that pre Dtrace? Because uh, yes. Dtrace has been described as that. A root kit. <laughs> that was destructive I think, Dtrace before... rootkit of sorts. Um, uh, th that does Good bring point. me to a to a question. Actually, um, uh, a beehive oriented question, of oh. course. Um, <laughs> we had we had the University of Budapest, I think, working for on on right. beehive. Am I right? Uh, yes. Oh, the UPB folks? Yes. Yeah, Bucharest. Yes. Bucharest. Bucharest sorry. Yeah, yeah Bucharest. Bucharest. It was um, Bucharest. Yes. Yes. I, I'm trying to understand that uh, if I even bring interest of universities in this region, I'm not sure if the knowledge or the skill set that people gain in universities, like how did that happen? That That's my initial question. Like, do people in that university learn about what the hell virtualization is? Or is it was like the name of the university, but it was actually a couple of students who were actually like learning by themselves. Like, uh, say I go to the American University of Armenia here, 
um, master's degree students, they have no idea how to exit Vim. And that is not a, uh, uh, that is not like, I'm, I'm not even trying to be, um, well, what's the right word here? Um, exaggeration. That is not an exaggeration that, that they can't exit Vim after four or five years of computer science, right? Uh, the, like I, I can I can't even talk about proper data structures or like their effects in a kernel. But, but how did that university work out? Like do do actually like did they teach free BSD for years and then interest came up? Do, do we have any backstory there? Because I would I would I, love to yeah, I, yeah go on. I don't I don't know the whole story. What I what I know for fact because I just posted the the, the slide deck for uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, suspend resume work that they did, and mm -hmm. this was under the umbrella of this assistant professor. Mihai Karabash. Yeah, he, and he was he was uh, or he is uh, interested in FreeBSD, and I suppose he was teaching that as well. I see, and I think that that is the 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 you know the hen and egg problem in almost all the universities to have someone who's kind of representing free BSD. If you don't have that kind of person, there's always the difficulty to place that because there's always Linux and Linux is easier. You know this kind of argument that's reiterating itself. In this instance, I suppose. The stars aligned. I don't know how else to call. I mean, it. I mean, I'm I'm not sure that Linux is easier because getting things done into the kernel is uh, our university uh, has tried worse. That. I think, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's worse. And like the feedback loop is different. Then you have commercial interests yeah. having their own uh, exactly. questions rising up. Uh, but I've I've noticed that on FreeBSD is easier based on my own experience, not not the universities. But like, would my first step be, hey, let me go to the university, get a university OS class, start teaching with FreeBSD? Obviously, half the students are gonna hate me again, uh, because you know what the hell are you teaching? Uh, and and then go over yeah. that. Okay, whoever's actually interested, we can start working on the kernel and start submitting, and your 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 name will be recorded into the in, into history thanks to git you know or something like that um so uh, i'm trying to get how would that process um also did they always contribute to beehive or did they contribute to other things as well because in the in the uh in uh, all, all of Good their point. work that i've seen has been mostly beehive oriented oh yeah uh i wish they could join more often uh by having an academic schedule, it's been mm -hmm. a slow, lengthy process for everything. And topics discussed in March in Tokyo haven't landed, like the LibVDSK. So uh, universities are an amazing resource and sometimes a challenge because they don't always align with the outside world. So somewhere between universities, a foundation, and companies, we need to find that right place to incubate such things, and maybe partnerships. Oh, Greg. So yeah, let's let's have that conversation separately because it's a challenge and it's been kind of frustrating for several involved, such as those funding their work. Like, okay, so hey team, and it's all public. Like, can you please get their work in? Well, it's not quite that ready. Because because yeah. I can imagine like teaching for say twelve weeks, and then for the last three weeks, I would do something like, hey, I need a group working on this jails issue, a group working on this tar fs issue etc and um uh, obviously out of like 100 students maybe only five would have the knowledge but probably five is all we need right uh yes and no um because always, always classes are large you don't you don't get like 20 students you usually get like half uh, the year group kind of at, at least depends that's how on if you do an introduction into operating system or implementation details uh, the data right. can be quite small uh, but the problem with universities is that you get university code so that means that a university if it works as a teaching university it's basically a pipeline so you have students moving through the university and they may do amazing work but they will always move on or at least that has to be the expectation unless you get the faculty, especially in, in more research focused universities or research institutions uh, involved, those can be great at the repositories of life knowledge. 
Oh, I, I assume that's fine because... Um, Can we um, save that for the Teach BSD call? And I just posted the list to, to make sure <laughs> yeah. Teach BSD, which does not have HTTPS. Uh, I, it sounds like everyone involved got a bit busy for that, um, actually. Just in case you haven't seen it, I'm not yeah. wanting to derail you, but I do want to get to some demos yeah. and other awesome stuff. Uh, no, I, I just want to point out like BSD here. started in the university, so I think we're that's we're idea. okay with the university code. We can we can make it a separate operating system later. True, but that was very much a strong <laughs> project rather than you know a, a, a rinse and repeat every September course. Yeah, that's all true, all of it. What I meant by research code is or university code is code which focuses on answering the current question and prove or proving a concept but not necessarily production ready code and if someone manages to get this interesting new feature to boot and uh, survive a live demo it doesn't mean that it will survive uh, a, a malicious attacker requires a very different mindset and C is about the worst language maybe after C++ to uh, write such code <laughs> in uh, especially for uh, a novice and the course is online from a mere eight to four years ago hmm. the teaching stuff doesn't really change that quickly but if lib and anyway Okay, let, no, no. now is not the time and place yep. to discuss that awesome, awesome topic. Mm. Uh, says, says moderator guy who wants to see your demos. Um, uh, I'll just put the links in there. Uh, so, and Chris, you made a very good point. There were some great videos from the last FreeBSD Vendor Summit. I don't know if they're all up and no, I'm not asking about my my lightning talk but there were some really good points made by really experienced folks there so check them out uh very briefly to get technical i did some experiments with iSCSI that did exactly what i wanted which was round tripping disk images to windows and freebsd but i found that i simply dropped an iSCSI target from the host into a virtual machine as a device and it sure didn't like it i kind of thought mm -hmm. that was possible and maybe tried it years ago it is possible it is possible does so if you want to expose want to a, so if you have beehive and you want to uh, allow a beehive guest access to a host disk or file or a, a piece of memory as a disk yeah. Uh, you use the come target layer CTL. Right. What about over iSCSI from another host? Uh, it's still a local disk, and you have to make it available yep. to the CTL, just like another local disk. And then you can put it on the virtual SCSI bus, create yep. a port on it. So basically, your virtual host bus adapter. Yep. Uh, then you use the LAN mapping feature to define which uh, LANs, so basically which virtual SCSI disk, are uh, visible to the port yeah. so that the virtual machine doesn't get access to all disks, and then uh, it works. Okay. So for whatever reason, over the network, it didn't treat me well and gave me that error, but that can wait. So that said... Uh, I've also verified that Occam BSD was working surprisingly well on 14, which I thought was broken, but that can wait. And if there's nothing else, I would love to hear some process supervision demos from you and Jan. Anything relating to Beehive NAT can wait. So uh, let me just grab the screen share. Yes, sir. Uh, boom. That is my little good list. And yeah, I, I found the right there. window. Right. Uh, I have too many windows open. I never want so, to. Um, so this is basically the view at the Atomic S6 RC services, then and if I want, and I can now say something like, uh, 
So Essex Beehive is your wrapper? Yes, that's my oh. wrapper. I should rename that, but I didn't come up with oh. a useful name. I uh, really should. I shouldn't squat um, Lawrence namespace prefix, but... Violate yeah. two trademarks at once, you mean? No, oh, kidding. No, uh, exactly. Uh, no, no. So um, now this um, interface is defined. Now I compile it. Okay. Then you could do it all in once and now. So now I, let's say. Have you included usage syntax in S6 Beehive? Yes and no, uh, yes, but not yet enough to be useful. Um, okay, just checking. And now the interface is here. And that's for the proper tracked build up and tear down? Yes, that's the hard part, basically. Um, no, now what about I the have to... easy part of managing a virtual machine in a proper manner? Yeah, that's, uh, I just have to plug that in now that I have the hard part, which is generating the S6 RC uh, services in a user-friendly manner so that you don't have to write them yourself, but the script, uh, basically, I can show you uh, the implementation. So I did something which may not be uh, how you are intended to use an rc.d script. Uh, let me make it a bit larger so that you can actually read the code. Yeah. Uh, what I'm doing here is uh, because the normal run RC command uh, uses eval, it breaks something like set dash E in the shell so that I can't use that as a safety net. So I did my own little helper just so that I have better um, debugging experience. Once it's properly tested, I can go back to the normal way. Uh, but for debugging purposes, it's so nice if the shell catches any failed process for me. So if I've forgot to handle an error case, it will not silently ignore that and fail three steps later, but it will immediately crash and burn at the right point in time, mm -hmm. which really makes it easier to debug shell scripts. And then... Yeah, does this handle... Quick question. Does, does, does this approach handle cases where you already have pre-existing bridges as well, or is this only um, for... Yes and no, it, uh, you can configure it in such a way. For example, my default bridge is bridge zero, which is my primary connection mm -hmm. to the outside world. And yes, I can put it in. Um, so let's uh, have a look here. Um, what I do here is basically... Um, da -da -da -da, um, Bridge zero dash k dash u. Um, oh, sorry, it's a bridge zero. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it now refuses to touch the script because that's hand generated from earlier. This is a safety hmm. net I have put in place. So if the service script looks different than what it expects, it refuses to touch the script and will not override your hand-generated scripts. Um, so for example, but the hand-generated, the difference is tiny and it's just uh, enough for the script to be able to notice it. Um, so for example, here is how I, if I do this now, now it will no longer complain because now it's how it would do it itself. Can I make my window a bit larger and you can still read yep. it? Because yep. I'm using long lines, I know. You're forgiven. So uh, the, I'm using my uh, wrapper script around IF config to make it unimportant. And that script again could use a better name right now. It's just called interface here. And um, what I'm telling it is, the um, code generator here 
uh, in add interface infers which uh, driver to clone from from the interface name. So if the interface name uh, begins with the name of a clonable driver, it will use that. And if it can't infer one this way, it defaults to tab. So basically, if you name your interface just VM0, it will be a tab. If you name it VMnet dash VM0, it's uh, VMnet. And if that doesn't work for you, you because you want to have a VMnet interface named top something because you like to confuse yourself, you can still uh, overwrite this. Or if you want to have a bridge, which does not start with bridge as a name, but is shortened to BR0 or something, uh, then you can set the cloner like this, bridge. And then, yeah. How are you tracking state? Or no, that's... So this is config is item potent, the service but... specification. So if we go here, okay. Let's go in here. So the format is very simple for the service. It's the type of service. There are three types of services. One shots. Mm -hmm. These are basically shell scripts you execute for the side effect. There are long runs, which are long running processes, which are the service you want. And there are a bundles of either of the three types. So a bundle can contain a bundle. Uh, and um, yeah, and the non-bundles can also have explicit dependencies, but bundles don't have explicit dependencies, they have members. So, and the up script is very simple. It just passes the right arguments to the um, helper script. And the helper script does the hard part of making sure that it's idempotent here. So that is already solved. The next step is, uh, let's have a look at the other services I have here, maybe in a more user-friendly color. Oh, someone. What's that? Uh, it's just starting to rain heavily outside, not a I problem. See. Um, okay, so um, if I define interfaces, I already put them in a bundle named after the cloner, just with a plural s as a suffix. So for example, if we go into the bridges, we can see that its type is bundle. And uh, membership is just conferred by having an empty file with the name. So only the name of a file is important. It's normally uh, an empty file. And again, I made sure never to delete anything which isn't an empty normal file. Uh, yeah. So the stuff I spend a lot of time on is making sure that if you, for example, if you do the wrong thing you, to your primary bridge, which is also how you SSH into the system, and uh, it goes down at least temporarily, you um, don't want to lock yourself out. So I made sure that the uh, state change is done under supervision and not attached to any controlling TTY, which could generate a sick hub, but instead through this uh, little helper service here. So if we go to var run sxp uh, scan, we can see that here are services which are just supervised as six processes, but not as six RC managed services. So basically they auto start and uh, have no dependency tracking. And these are the helpers and they deactivate themselves if they're not needed. And this one does the initial setup of the symlink uh, magic. Uh, this one is the one which handles reloading. And this is the default logging process. So if we look at DTPS3, this is how my pro uh, the relevant parts of my process tree look. Let's make that. That's not bad. So um maybe a bit higher. Yeah. 
So right now it's running uh, the supervisor not as a chi direct child process of init, but uh, just in a TTY so that I can easily watch for errors and stuff. But normally it would be set up a bit different. And then uh, the trick is that there is this, um, to solve the chicken and egg problem, I have, uh, a named uh, pipe here and the supervisor opens this for writing and then the it will inherit this to all its, of its children as their um, standard output and standard error. So that if something just writes to standard output or standard error as part of the supervision tree, it will end up here in this. So basically anything is which is uh, written to standard out is just timestamp the line and write it out. And yes, that does proper log rotation per line. So it will never fill up your var log unless you set ridiculous limits intentionally. And yeah. What was your, what were your flags for the, uh, was it DP? DPS tree, 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 DPS it will run as a more, it's listed in etc TTYs. It works like that, but just for easier testing and restarting so that I'm just not running it like that at the moment. Then here is the uh, supervisor for each long running service. There is a tiny little supervisor process, which has like two or three pages worth of uh, local memory, like just its stack. Um, the supervisor is a finite state machine with no dynamic resource allocation at all. Um, then here are the helper scripts, which are named after the commands where basically a wrapper around. And this here is the uh, one shot runner. It's a long running, you can think of it as sudo as a service. Um, and it can be told by the service manager to please run this one shot script uh, now. And that means that basically the one shot scripts are not run in the foreground, but they're run by this one shot runner and they inherit a proper process environment with environment variables, file descriptors, and so on, so that the logs end up at the right place and so on and you don't leak your environment like locale and so on to them uh, unintentionally. You can see the implementation detail underneath here. Uh, and this is a helper process uh, which can be used to store file descriptors by name. So for example, if you want to connect uh, two or more processes through a pipe, you can create a pipe uh, with helper tools. You don't have to do that manually. And you just say, I want this process to be a producer and this process to be its consumer. And if they both declare that I'm producing for you and I'm consuming from you, then the system will connect them through a pipe held in trust here. So that if even if both we start at the same time, they get the same pipes again so that nothing is lost and then you can set them up. And yes, it supports um, then in from multiple processes, but that has downsides, but it's totally supported if you need it. Yeah. Jan, I have a pedantic question. Yes. Uh, if you look at S6RC one shot runner. Yes. The other it ones have a hyphen after S6. That uh, where are there. you here? So, Sorry, uh, actually, where you're highlighted. The... Oh, yeah, that's just uh, 
this is the command name, this is what the, these two are uh, implementation details of S6 uh, RC. Okay. And the com these are scripts I have written. Um, and so I named the hyphen the command them line command the they are invoking as the primary function. So uh, okay. it's, yes, it's an, it's pedantic, but it's not irrelevant, but it's also. It just looks just like a that, typo to me because I don't no, know. No, it's not a typo. Okay, it's, good. Cool, cool, cool. It is what it is. Uh, yeah. Chris, on a scale of one to Hauptbahnhof, how does that look in what you imagined when you first heard the words beehive process management and man management in general? I think it shows that there's quite some complexity, um, which was to be expected. I can already tell you, I will be rewatching the recording to make sure that I really fully understand what's going on here. So, and I need nice to read up on S6, so S6RC. Yeah. Um, if you have the minutes from yesterday, I gave a, I posted a link to the my old slide deck on S6RC for FreeBSD with the focus of using it as alternative to the existing RC.D and in it, so that you really boot use a, a, a bare metal FreeBSD machine with S6 as in it system. I checked that out. I was quite astonished with the fast booting time that you listed. So yeah, I will, um, I will dig into that. The trick is just not doing uh, lots of slow shell scripts with weight loops uh, with a one second polling rate or something in there, like uh, the NetIF script or, and doing things as soon as their uh, dependencies are satisfied and not once everything uh, sorted before them is finished. So it's a mixture of doing less and doing what you are doing in parallel. What, which really helps, it's really the biggest monolith I couldn't get down in the boot time was just the time it took to uh, initialize the GPU driver. That's the main culprit. If I didn't have to mode uh, change, uh, it would be a lot faster. And maybe better these days. I haven't tested it on real, on a desktop system or laptop uh, in a while. Because having to maintain all of this uh, just for your personal workstation is a lot. So having to maintain all of that, what it takes to boot a FreeBSD system to a useful workstation. Uh, and it changes over time and so on. But uh, just supporting what Beehive needs is a fraction of that and potentially useful to more people. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so if you uh, if you have a look of what, uh, how this, these services log uh, in this directory, so because you can't uh, atomically chain, uh, write a whole directory in Unix, unless you count mounting read-only file systems, uh, then, then you have to uh, really create the directory and then symlink it into place so that you can atomically update a directory by path. So what a, this is what I do here, for example. So this here is how a long-running S6 service directory looks. Um, the yeah. event directory, what is it? Is this this? Is... No, uh, what's the, uh, what is the flag to have? Anyway, uh, let's do this. Um... So we have two directories in each uh, long running service. Uh, the supervised contains the supervisor state and control uh, pipe. Uh, and the event one, basically anyone who wants to get notified can put a name pipe in there. And then whenever the supervisor state changes, it will uh, go in this directory and write a sim single byte status update 
to every named pipe in this directory, which uh, is how S6 implements polling free notification. This so called um, FIFO deal is neat because it gets away without having to have a long running daemon. The downside is that if you uh, basically run out of resources and have a blocking writer, the block uh, blocking reader, the blocking reader will lose the latest messages. So it's for this special case that's good enough uh, and really nice because it gets away without having to run a message bus daemon. Uh, but the downside is that you it's quite limited as to what you can do, but it works for the use case of a service manager. Mm, then we have a bunch of files in here. The notification FD file, if it exists, it must contain just a number, which is the file descriptor number of a file descriptor. You're supposed to write a single byte to and then close it by convention in new line. That's how you signal deep readiness within S6RC. So that's the whole protocol. You know or know for an environment where, where, where the pipe is and you do something like echo. In a shell script, because I don't have the file script to open, it's an error, but this is how you could implement the whole readiness notification protocol in shell. Just write a new line to this file descriptor and then close it. Closing it is optional. It's just that you don't need it afterward. And yeah, that's the idea. And then the run script, normally this would be an, an executable of any sort. It could be a shell script. It could be a, a copy of a native executable, or it could just be a sim link, which is what I'm doing uh, to keep um, it easier to implement, I'm sum linking to my rc.d script and my rc.d script looks at the current working directory and the zero argument, so the name under which it's invoked to detect that it's uh, invoked under the name run or finish in one of the supervisor's working directories. And then it will basically dispatch similar to how sendmail does it. You have one executable and depending on which name you invoke it, it does something different like mail queue versus mail. Um, and that's uh, just so that I don't have to uh, write out uh, the code from here docs or something. I can just have a single shell script which fulfills multiple functions depending on where it is invoked from under which name. Uh, which yeah, avoids having to uh, generate executable shell code at runtime or at compile time even. And yeah, that's about the scope of it. Any uh, questions? Do you have time available in your future to keep going in this wonderful trajectory? That's the plan, at least. Excellent. How can we help at this early stage or mid uh, stage? Give me a little more time so that I can write the run scripts for uh, Piaf and then come back to basically integrating with AOS Gazi. Ah, yes. Oh, do tell. Yes. That's yes, yeah. great. Well, Godspeed. I'm very impressed with so that. Because Thank I would so like to basically have this also handle basically the things I wanted to handle is fetching uh, install images unmodified from some kind of upstream. So that it basically knows a list of this operating system, this version, this hash, just a source of truth so that I can just uh, fetch or curl them or whatever. Okay. Mm, and then check them against the manifest, which would be part of the port once it becomes a port. Um, the idea behind that is that it should just be easy and it should be able to boot unmodified ISOs so that it does not suffer the fate of several existing Beehive-related projects where you're limited to the 
versions and this was someone um, patched uh, to work with back then Beehive Load or something yep. or Grub Beehive. Or Grub Beehive, yeah. Um, yeah, that used to be what you had to do. Mm, yeah. Um, now that we have proper EFI booting, it's realistic that distress should just file. boot unmodified ISOs. And uh, the other part is that um, I wanted to uh, basically, yeah, the networking interface creation is there. The network interface destruction has to be uh, finished. So the removing one from the from the definitions, not destroying them. Destroying them already works, yeah. but forgetting about it then is not yet implemented. Then uh, doing the same with basically Z vaults. And so that it, you can say, I want to create a Z vault of this size and block size and so on. That's not really a service management question. It's just a one-time thing you do. But it could be made a service in that the service verifies that the right the Z vault has the right size, and if not, it it at least grows it automatically, and refuses to start if the uh, file is too small, uh, too large, or something. So that uh, it would not uh, truncate your Z vault, uh, but it would uh, refuse to say, "I'm ready." If, you said I want an eight gig Z wall and it's a sixty four gig Z wall. Huh. It will just say no, nope, something isn't right. I have not reached my intended state. Ah, nice. So, well, yeah, make it so. I look forward to that. And then oh, once I have that, uh, yeah, make the Z walls available via come target layer as bit I or SCSI device, and that then run Beehive on top of it, preferably inside a jail. Magnificent. I love it. Anything else? And the, the jailing part is a good exp uh, example of where the proper service management comes in for things like making sure that you have not just a jail, but a jail and a device file system. And the device file system starts out as uh, just the minimal common jail uh, rule set. And then the mount point is extended by the Beehive specific devices for this Beehive guest, so that you have the VMM and VMM uh, IO port device available, and just the tap VM net or whatever uh, device and the sim link to it, so that you can open it by name. And then yeah, the that said, do you think you'll optionally jail or institutionally jail the Beehive uh, For I don't see a reason why not to jail in 14. And uh, institutionally, like by default, that's the only option, a bit like the yeah, why, why, uh, containing not, Beehive? Why uh, support not jailing at that point? Yeah, excellent. Uh, because you don't lose anything right now. That's great. Uh, with the patch I with your support, Michael, I got into 14. You're welcome. Uh, the link state uh, stuff works again, and Beehive no longer refuses to start if you disable uh, IPv4 and IPv6 yep. inside the jail. Excellent. So, yeah, that works as intended. Fantastic. And is in. Um, and that means that we can have a Beehive, and I don't know if I will just run Beehive the jail uh, with the root file system as jail path, or uh, preferably I would generate the minimal file system so that I basically use LDD to tell me uh, which uh, libraries are required. And then, uh, oh, I lost the screen. I did, I zinged it. Anything else? No problem. I had asked. Uh, yeah, so the idea is to basically use LDD on the Beehive executable. And if I have it, um, it tells me uh, which libraries I need, I copy those into slash lib uh, of the jail. And then the executable and the runtime link, and then I have like a five or six megabyte large uh, file system. I mark that read only. And again, I can make sure that whenever the jail is running, it's there, it's all that is there so that if you have an escape, you're inside 
capsicum inside a jail uh, restricted to a file system with a minimal set of devices. Excellent. And totally logged in. Uh, and yeah. Did I share the right screen? Yes, you shared your cool. uh, browser tab. With... Anything else at this time relating to that? So there is to just basically ch check some all the files with uh, compare uh, CMP on the command line, check if any one of them changed, or maybe run, oh no, I can do it even better by just using entry on it. And then, yeah. Or tar it all up and yeah, tar can just create a tarball of it all and then that would also work, yeah. Really, I love it. Yeah, and just check some of the tarball every time so that basically I do read the data on each creation basically of marking the ZFS file system is ready, but I wouldn't write anything out because reads can be cached, writes can't really. <laughs> Not in the same sense. Yep. Okay, so, fantastic work. Keep it coming. I look forward to testing that. And I've rehashed my lab a little bit, rehabbed it too. Yeah, I want to I want to second that. If if you can share that in some way that we can try that out and I don't know, and maybe even enrich it with some documentation that we sure. write around that. Yeah. He's got a few Obviously items to work on, but your, your velocity is impressive. And I thank you for that because discussions are materializing and thank you. Thank you, Danke. Uh, then shifting gears ever so briefly, Antonig is home and is setting up. Um, Jan, earlier you mentioned perhaps unattended D-trace. Could that have been anonymous D-trace? I see a few things about that from both Oracle. Could be. And uh, They called it, I think, unattended, but it may have different names. To, okay. uh, at least. <laughs> cool. It was. It, I had never heard of it, and that's great. Because I do mention boot time and early. Yes, early boot trace. time D-trace is uh, the, what I meant, the function. Okay, a super quick question. Some time ago, we had worked out cor corrective NAT with PF and IPFW. However, since you've enlightened us to the proper usage of an IP on the bridge, does that strategy change any? Sorry, say again. So. A year or so ago, we had you and I had you had helped me set up a a system for say a laptop with proper NAT that you can sit on Wi-Fi and have virtual machines. If one were to use their IP on the bridge, would that strategy change any? So you could have a laptop with IPv6 and virtual machines. So uh, you can have that already. The problem is that uh, Wi-Fi. Um, uh, Basically, you have to run, to truly support it. What you have to do is uh, what is this four MAC address uh, frame format, where yeah. basically you uh, each Ethernet frame on the Wi-Fi to support bridging over Wi-Fi has to have both the original source address, the Wi-Fi client's source MAC address, uh, the access point destination as destination address, and the real destination address, which is what for example, Wi-Fi bridging does, and it's not universally supported, especially not on the FreeBSD's Wi-Fi drivers, but a lot of access oh, points and so on do not support this at all. It's it's really a fee, um, special kind of feature. Um, what you can do is you can run your jails or beehive gets on a loopback or on a bridge and then... Uh, not out to the outside network. And that's what we did, but if you yep. put the proper IP on the bridge device, will that- It doesn't help because question? the bridge is uh, at layer two, you would see the access point would have to support the bridge. Uh, and that means that it sees the uh, MAC address of the Beehive guest. There's no net on layer two there. Okay. So, and that means that your laptop is now connected with its MAC address, but sends Ethernet frames on behalf of the Beehive guests yeah. with the Beehive guests MAC address as source MAC address. So you need this uh, free address uh, MAC 
format for the Ethernet uh, wireless frames instead of the normal free address format where you only have one extra address and implicitly the uh, client is either the source or the destination. Mm, yeah, that's uh, the problem. Is there a clean solution on FreeBSD yeah. and 14? If you have a driver, a wireless access point uh, available which supports this and uh, BFS, uh, unless you do have it, so a driver for it in FreeBSD and an access point which also supports it, then without that, you're out of luck. You can't do it. Is um, there a driver it, in FreeBSD or that's hypothetical? I think there used to be, at least for some of the older 11. Uh, G and N cards. Oh, I don't. I don't know uh, what's the state of that is today, but let's say the cards where I know that it used to work are so old that you wouldn't want to use them with virtual machines, especially. Um, but what there is is um, the option of basically doing some kind of NAT, and then you can either use the tap interfaces in a routed mode and not use a bridge. Uh, or you have a bridge with a network on it, which makes it the network configuration on your host a bit simpler. Right. So then, and then my you whole question is, with that basic... and the bridge, is that indeed a solution? Well, it's good enough to get your virtual machines okay. online. Got it. Okay. So it via IPv4, okay. it, you can port forward. For IPv6, you have the usual options there, which means you can do either prefix translation or single address uh, NDP uh, forwarding because with IPv6, you have lots of addresses. And what you could do is basically put in an NDP proxy uh, into your host NDP cache and then put a, a, a host route on a, a tab or VMNet interface. And then you would have basically the guest be... Um, you kind of would lie to it that it's, yeah, you're on a slash 64. It just happens that there's only this address working on it, which is your default gateway. And your address is also working. It's not perfect, but it would be good enough to, I don't know, fetch code from something that which isn't GitHub. Okay. Um, uh, what's an example NDP proxy? The NDP command. NDP command. Oh my gosh. Um, okay. It has a proxy mode, just like the app command. You put in an, uh, a static address in, with a flag. Yeah, there it and is. Then, and then you put in a more specific route uh, on the tab interface. That's good enough for unicast traffic. Um, the better solution maybe is something. So yeah, there are things we don't talk about, like uh, NUT 66. Mm. And not if you have a network, there's a clean solution available to you. If your upstream network, which you are connected to, let's say it's a Fritz box or something, so some of the not oh so terrible CPEs, you can just say, please delegate me a slash 64 prefix, and that also works. Hmm. That's what I used for my S6 uh, and bit, uh, or SCSI prototype where I had a pure IPv6 deployment in my home network. But the reason why you couldn't test it is because your home network doesn't support this. OK. Uh, ever so briefly for our third hour, uh, Antronig, are you ready for a demo of your run it work? Checking, checking. Just and, let me make sure if everything is ready. And once finished, you, Antronig, you. you may want to catch the recording of uh, Jan's demo. Yeah, so the the better solution would be to just uh, take your lab machine and attach it to a wired network. Yeah, and those solution. little dongles that do the connecting are one's friend, if I can find mine. No, they're not. They're oh, terrible it's worked USB well for Ethernet me. devices. Okay. USB Ethernet NICs are hard. I didn't say Ethernet. Efficient. No, they're they're it's a small device with that is oh. a Wi-Fi handling to Ethernet. And the GLI net ones are kind of cool and they actually run like DDWRT and GLNet. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I think I showed you one in either Yeah, um, I, or... I just have to wait for the 37C3 pre sale website to start up for the Who's Chaos Communication Link? Congress. Oh, oh, oh CC, yes, of course. Okay. Yeah, it's, it may sell out quickly, so I want to... Quick, yes. 
I want to see a live blog from that <laughs> and stream. Ah, yes. Which is your device? And is it USB powered? So at least you can use it in the in the uh, conference hall with uh, no power within reach. Exactly. Uh, you can you can plug it into USB, but it's got an Ethernet port and everything. So, but also Wi-Fi. No, that doesn't really help you uh, for IPv no. because it has the same constraint. If your wireless access point doesn't allow you to make use of this format, you can't you just use a different device to suddenly be able to do that. I see. Okay, let's shelve that discussion for so, later. Uh, these devices normally are implemented as pure IPv4 with NAT. And Antrenig is booting Sophie. away. I'm here. I'm here. You, I you, know. You, and you're, you're me, booting. Right? You mentioned on. Oh, Antrenig, okay. will you make it to Case Communication Congress? Uh, no, no, no. Probably not. As, as sad as that is. When does that take place? Uh, February. No. Uh, between uh, between Christmas and New Year's. Oh, right. That was always so an odd 27th time. to oh. 30th uh, of next month. The website's always in German. Wait, Can which, I have a beehive which... meetup. What? There we hmm? go. Chris, are you going? Sorry, what event is that? Chaos. Uh, Chaos Communication Congress. Oh, Chaos Computer Club. Oh, Chaos Computer Club. Um, I was not aware of that. I'm Checking it out right now. Okay, cool. Yeah, pre sale just started uh, 30 seconds ago. 2,700 people in front of me in the queue. Good. Oh, on the, oh, on let's island. say 2,700 se browser sessions. <laughs> they tell you. <laughs> uh, do you want to share your screen and walk us through the process? That sounds no. Yeah, I will definitely not make it. I wish I was around Europe, but no, sorry. I'm currently having issues with my server. Just give me a sec. I'm 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 just making sure that our data center isn't having maintenance. That Ooh. would be very <laughs> bad timing. Yes, because uh yeah, someone might have thought that hey, it might be a good idea to do it tonight. Good, sir, have you pushed your repo or not? I have pushed Ooh. not the latest change, but the oh. one previous. Yes. Okay. Jan also has helped me in, uh, as you know, Jan has the ability to fix code while he's reading without even running it. So uh, we, we, he, uh, we, we went over Only some changes. Only because as well. I was fixing the same bugs in my own code. Yes. <laughs> um, By running it multiple times. What, what do I have to show at least for the moment? One sec. One sec. Um, maybe where is Michael on the document? Oh my God! Today's doc is very long. Extremely. Let's give you that. Um, maybe I should just upload an image here for a second. So this is, damn, I hate computers. Okay, this is what it looks like at the moment. Um, Are you going to be sharing? Nope. Um, I currently I just pasted an image right here paste yeah there you go google do you see it on the dock uh, uh let's see something moved uh feel free I... to do it before the adjournment there down at the bottom uh yeah scroll to the bottom i put it wherever your cursor My computer's was barely moving uh, it's okay computers are not that smart oh i hope Killing these dumb but fast. Uh, uh, oh, oh, pages unresponsive. I love it. Okay, wait. Yeah, I want to wait. I kill the maybe it of gets better if you close brain. like 100 or 200 tops or so. <laughs> That's me. Have you ever oh. noticed that if you run out of the 255 tabs you can have on an iPad, you can have 255 more uh, private tabs? Ah, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, sorry, I missed that part. Uh, anonymous D-Trace? Oh, so early on uh, at the very beginning, 
Jan had mentioned the either either unattended D-trace or something that could be used for boot time profiling. And then I did a quick search while other things were happening and I found anonymous D-trace, which might have yes. been what he's referring to. Hopefully my browser. Yeah, the uh, idea is that you don't have a, basically you preload a D-trace script to run without a consumer so that it yes. get, the data gets captured during boot and then you can mm -hmm. later uh, collect the buffer. Yeah, and, and, but I'm not sure <laughs> that would work as a um, an, an alternative to the one that you were suggesting or one of you was suggesting well, was about tracing the boot time because D-Trace itself needs to be loaded in able to start mm, tracing. No. Oh, uh, really? In Solaris, at least not. It can be basically done by the kernel before the kernel fully boots. They have used it for debugging boot issues. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. But it may be that FreeBSD's port does not include this bit. Or maybe nobody knows about it. And that's why I asked, because I recently learned about the, the existence of this feature on another operating system and wondered why uh, Colin wrote his own boot trace uh, framework instead of building on top of D-Trace. Can I ask what the other operating system was? Uh, Solaris. Okay. Outside, are you, you probably heard the podcast you, knowing you. Yeah, of course. Are you running pure Solaris or are you running like Omni OS? I'm not something? running Solaris. They just described how they used it oh, okay. Got on it. the podcast uh, and that they're missing this from other tools like e, uh, eBPF tracing. So some eBPF doesn't have something like this? No, it doesn't according to them, but they are not well enamored of it so they may not know everything about it because they consider it distasteful and only deal with it to support customer uh, requirements i heard a comment that ebbf was harder than c plus plus but i could be have misheard that so. well it depends on what you mean by ebpf hmm. ebpf is basically bpf with a bunch of extensions so it's just a bytecode machine uh, with certain restrictions which have been a bit loosened to make it more powerful and useful. But that's about it. And then you have the tooling to make use of it in certain runtimes. So you have maybe a runtime for packet processing, you have one for system call interception, you have one for other things, and so on. And then it's basically uh, your glue interface to get bytecode into the kernel with all the horrible things that implies and all the power that it implies. Uh, Jan, how is your CCC ticket purchase coming? Uh, ticking along. So far, 2,000 sessions in front of me, but I do have the voucher code, so I should okay. be able to get something. It's, it's just ticking along. So instead of letting the website crash and burn and everyone gets annoyed at them, they now have a queue in front of a payment system. And yeah, yeah it works they have, now. Since when do they have a business class ticket? Yes, we do. But are you an organizer? Not this year. <laughs> okay. Great answer. Um, no, like yeah, no, my server is in maintenance mode. Okay. Apparently, currently in... Uh, what do you call that? Um, in IPMI, apparently the servers are being updated for okay. some reason. Well, we've uh, covered some great ground, and yeah. this is one of those episodes we may need to carefully re-listen to, and hopefully the transcription oh, no. will be reasonably good. Um, yeah, I, I, I do have to point out that everyone's been saying that eBPF is awesome. But cool. okay. I tried only the tracing facility and compared to dtrace is basically comparing Linux to FreeBSD. It's it just sounds good, but in practice it's not mature at all. One example maybe to uh, get an appreciation of what are the problems of eBPF tracing is that it doesn't even warn you by default if you're a uh, buffer overran and you lost samples yes. and so now mm -hmm. your trace is incomplete. Mm -hmm. and potentially heavily biased and uh, thereby meaningless almost. And yeah, so if you want, for example, to tra uh, trace uh, 
IO latency and you have certain IO operations which may be completely missing because they were the most pathological ones, good luck. If and, you're lucky, and, you notice that you have operations. So only if it matters. <laughs> and a lot of people want to move the eBPF technology into other operating systems. And, and honestly... That's... Sorry, it's it's uh, it's 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 OCI standard all over again. Like mm. they are solving a, f a Linux specific issue with Linux specific tooling, and then people <sighs> are like, "Oh, this is it's 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 a different story." Um, yes, yeah, uh, you. I'm sure. In you my opinion, what it does is uh, the technology, not eBPF trace, but eBPF solves the problem of extending the Linux kernel in a binary compatible way without putting things uh, into the mainline kernel so that you can have vendor features to be glued into the kernel without basically having to fork the kernel or finally get your ass um, in gear and upstream it so that you can have your also special magic vendor source uh, live it for things like um, network offloading functionalities, uh, some kind of uh, snake oil, uh, antivirus software, whatever, to basically inspect the system um, without having to become a part of the mainline kernel because the available APIs and ABIs uh, in Linux are once at one point uh, only GPL and on the other hand, uh, so unstable because uh, the Linux kernel is only compatible with the user land interface. This it has committed to and with the stuff in mainline. If you have code living somewhere outside and you're not also well connected that they still uh, care about you, you're out of luck. That's the problem with a lot of things. And the other part is that it's hard to do it the right way in the kernel and you would have to refactor subsystems in a way which basically work against the interest of a large user base but are only useful to your smaller user base and then it really becomes tempting to use this kind of technology to have a bypass so it's not just negative it actually has a technical merit the idea of having a bytecode machine to script things, uh, but it's not your universal one-size-fits-all solution, which some make it out to be for either love with weird and quirky and theoretically flexible technology or just because uh, it serves their business purposes. Whereas so something started. like, yeah, so eBPF is a lot more than just eBPF trace, potentially. Ah, okay. Um, there, you said it, I repeated it. Don't EBPF is a fairly, the, the basic idea of taking BPF and extending it is a very flexible and generic tool which we shouldn't just because it's used for questionable things not the whole technology i can't basically the whole yeah the fundamental technology isn't the problem it's certain applications of that um and oftentimes both those um trying to uh fan up the hype and those using it don't know the details because it is very intricate the, to tell apart what is meant by eBPF hmm. in a certain context. Anything else? We're at just Antoinette? over two hours. Antoinette, you good? Did your system come up? Or we wait till next time? Oh no, his computer's on fire. 
if I were to call this, then the encoding will start and I can start posting these for our careful dissection because wow, we got into detail. Yeah. Antrenig, you there? He's muted. I don't know what happened. Uh -oh. if he's muted and frozen out or um, of this call or if he's just muted because he's trying to fix the server as fast as possible, hoping to still show us something. I don't know. Yeah, we need his like and subscribe. <laughs> hmm. I'll keep bump. Oh, and my computer is so slow, it is like ridiculous. So this browser needs a really bad restart. So on that note, I say let's call it, unless Antonik's about to jump in, and thank you, everyone. See you perhaps next Wednesday, and I can stick around for a little bit, but my browser absolutely needs a reboot. Thank you, and happy Thanksgiving uh -huh. for all who celebrate. Stopping the screen sharing may also help. Take care.